Hello and welcome to Realm's Edge Gaming. In this episode we're going to take a look at the third story in the Chronicles of the Wanderer and the story is titled The Maker's Mark. So this story appeared in White Dwarf issue 462. So the stories are going to be coming a little less frequently now because we've actually caught up with um, the White Dwarf um, monthly release schedule. So we've had quite a few at the moment. Um, I'm going to have to do them in line with when they're released with White Dwarf. So they won't be as frequent. This title of the story is called The Maker's Mark. And as we know, the Dwarden of the Ironweld Arsenal are famed for their forge craft. Yet when engineer Rickorn McCasrin journeys to Hish to participate in a craft fair, he finds that his work is critiqued not just by the Lumineth, but also by a mysterious Dwarden traveller. Now, as has been the case with these stories, the introductory paragraph really does set the scene. So let's have a read of it and, and then we'll kind of make a real start with the story. One can hardly speak of the Dwarden without remarking on their tenacity and stubbornness. Their reverence for past deeds or their love of gold, but to those with more than a passing familiarity with legend, and to any who have been blessed with cause to venture into the grand halls where they dwell, it is their skill at artifice that defines them. Masters of stone and metal, and the makers of intricate machines are they. The Kazalid Empire of old was home of thousands of wonders with colonies in all eight mortal realms and untold sub-realms beyond, many of which were conjured by the realm craft of the Duard in themselves. Places where rare gems ran like water, or where the clockwork of the cosmos arcane could be accessed and amended to their needs. Sigmar had little to teach the forefathers of the Duard in when it came to the art of building. Indeed, had he half the wisdom back then that he has since been forced to acquire, Perhaps he would have learned a thing or two from the Duardin, and the sad history of that time would have been different. The passing of myth and the touch of chaos has left many races diminished in their crafts, but not so the Duardin. Their skill is all that it once was, and in many cases furthered by the priv privation and need. It is only the means and the materials at their disposal that are lesser now than in the days of their glory. So, the first character that we meet is Rickorn McCasrin, as he tries to navigate his way through Hish to the craft fair of the Lumineth, where he can demonstrate the iron weld craft work that he is so proud of. The journey, however, is incredibly difficult, and it's likened to a maze, where everything seems to have a hidden meaning, light is shining all the time, pathways are not always obvious, and the brightness is burning. Macazarin is continually and meticulously noting the journey in his logbook and updating it as he goes. So, should he fail and his son need to do the journey, he has a starting point because he is not the first um, Dwarden of his family to attempt to reach this fair. His uh, father and grandfather beforehand have tried to um, compete in the craft fair, but unfortunately, Hish has um, tricked them, beguiled them, and otherwise defeated them, and they have been unable to find um, the city where they're heading. So, after a while of trying, he grows tired and, and lays out a bedroll for a rest. And he, he kind of takes part in a, a kind of strange little ritual. So, it says, as he laid out his bedroll for the night, Mikazrin found himself thinking long about what a master engineer of the Iron World might accomplish with such lore of the Lumineth. He smiled like a beardling indulging in a favourite fantasy and set a small pewter ancestor figurine by his stony pillow. The ancestor was male, but the features were too idealised and generic for him to say that they resembled anyone in particular. Nevertheless, when he touched its metal bust and gruffed his short nightly prayer to Grungni, the maker, it was his father, grandfather and the great-grandfather he had never met whose likenesses were in his mind. I'll see out the family dream, he muttered to them all. I'll be the Macazrin whose work sees the other side. Then, ensuring his volley pistol was fully loaded and underneath his pillow, he slotted the thickest and blackest lenses that Iron Wild Craft could cut into his goggles and fell straight to sleep. 
After a while, Mikazrin is awoken by a loud clang. So he gathers up all of his things and quickly goes after the source of battle. For he would not walk on and leave a fellow traveller in danger. He'd been raised better than that and honour wouldn't allow it. And this is what he sees. A Duardin in cunningly wrought armour. A mail coat made of interlocking Gromril cogs rather than the usual rings, stood in the light of the clearing. He was laden with packs and baggage, and over it he wore a red coat stuffed with pockets. His long white beard was girded in glimmering gromril plates, with the golden stamp of the Ironweld on each one, though of which city's school Mikazrin could not make out over that distance. In his gauntleted hands was a large double-bladed axe. It was a simple weapon, ill-suited to an Ironweld Iron World forge master, but at the same time, the most singularly beautiful piece that Mikazrin had ever seen. It was though Hish again spoke to him in riddles and double meaning, but there was little about the axe that was not plain and deliberately made so. The blade was deeply incised with gold lettering, the intense and unforgiving light of Hish finding in its metalwork no fault or flaw as it flashed and glittered, chopping deeply, into obstinate stone. So, our mysterious dwarf in our old uh, master, um, the white beard, is actually fighting with a mountain elementor. And between the two of them, between Macazrin and the old master, um, they do defeat the mountain elementor um, because Macazrin uses his volley pistol. Although the old master later says that he had the beastie under control. He's still grateful though, and Macazrin is about to destroy the body of the Elementor when the old Dwardin says, Don't beardling. The grip that appeared around Macazrin's wrist was unbelievably strong, enough for Macazrin to let the beardling slide. The old Dwardin forced his aim aside from the crumbling mound of stone. The Realm Lords prefer their predators be, as annoying as that might be for the rest of us. If you're looking to cross their mountains and earn their favour, then honouring their ways is as good a place to start as any. Mikazrin nodded his thanks and holstered his pistol, while the old Dwardin watched in apparent bafflement. He took off his pack, pulled out the log and graver that he was always careful to pack last, and scratched the engineer's advice into the marginalia. Only then did it occur to him what else the old master had said. His gaze shot up. The Dwarden was looking at him wryly from under prickly white brows. What makes you think I'm looking for the Realm Lords? The old Dwarden puffed on a long stemmed pipe, the smoke curling into curious and meaningful shapes as it climbed. As with all things in that place, it sought to draw the eye hither and make the mind wander, but never quite succeeded, not with that old Dwarden sat beneath it. So, between them, they share um, supplies um, and the, the, the dwarf, the dwarf and the old master, introduces himself as Gromdal the Wanderer. Um, so, Gromdal the Wanderer, your honoured friend, um, and he, he thanks him for, for you know, for, for helping um, him defeat the Elementor. Um, Rickhorn actually, um, you know, puts up the courage again to ask... Um, how did you know I was seeking the Realm Lords? Mikazrin asked again, while the Elder crunched on a salted cake. It's the time of the contest, unless my scent is way off. So, it was no great guess on my part. You seem well prepared for the journey. <laughs> Better than most who make it. Have you ventured to the Sayari capital before? Mikazrin shook his head. My great-grandfather was the first to attempt the journey, but he didn't make it across the wastes. My grandfather made it to the mountains, only to be bested by them. He pulled the logbook from his pack and opened it, simultaneously displaying it while holding the precious thing closer to his lap. When one of them made the attempt, they took this with them, making particular note of what they learnt on the journey and how they failed. Gormdal nodded sagely. Good and methodical. My ancestors were well known of the Greenfire and Ironweld in their time. You could call it the family obsession. Plenty in the arsenal do. Well, you might just be the one to prove them wrong. You're not far off the city now. And I judge the worst of the mountain's trials to be behind you. 
You have been to our Anaskath? Aye, said Gormdal, his heavy face deep with reverie, many times. The first time I beheld it was long ago, when the elves in this realm were fewer, and may my own kin forgive me for uttering it, but its beauty was poorer for it. Nowadays it's a true wonder of the mortal realms, and I say that not lightly, but as one who's laid eyes on the forge eternal of Sigmaron, and even the great works of Elixir, before Grungni's city was lost to our kind. Mikazrin was no callow beardling, but his mouth had fallen wide. What was it like? That lad, I'll never say, and nor counts it against the tally of favours that I owe. One day, perhaps, one day soon, you might see it for yourself, but you might not. And I'll not haunt your remaining days with the knowledge of what can be never be again. However poorly Edwardin's word can serve the maker's wonder. Is it so glorious? Aye, it is that, and then some. Macazrin looked at that elder with awe. From what school do you hail, Longbeard? It must be famous indeed. No school, lad. You must have been trained somewhere. I don't stick the wanderer after my name for nothing, you know. How is it that I've never heard of you? As journeyed a cogsmith as you claim to be, must be renowned amongst the realms over. My claims, as you call them, are all true, if a trifle exaggerated in the telling, but even Edwardin's legend can't endure the test of time. He drew on his pipe and tapped the bowl on the axe resting on the grass by his side. But the work now. So, after that, they they, they kind of they, they meet one another um, and the old warden, Dwardin, sorry, asks to see Mikazrin's work. But Mikazrin refuses and says, you can see it along with the rest of everyone else when I presented at the festival at Aranaskath. Both Dwardin get some rest, but when Mikazrin awakes, Gormdal has gone. Finally, after setting off on his journey, Mikazrin reaches Aranaskath, and it is beautiful. But whilst the elves are friendly, there seems to be a hidden meanness and an air of disdain about them. And he meets one of the Lumineth Realm Lords, who says, Are you in need of some direction, friend? An elf in a shimmering gown of yellow suncloth, embroidered with rows of white checkers, approached from the crowd. He wore an elaborate fan-like headpiece, adorned with jewels and glass, and an ether quartz splint that made the whole ensemble glow. Macazrin was attired in perfectly serviceable travelling gear and mail, and had never wanted for better, but he felt suddenly rough and unpolished in the elf's company. He smoothed out his beard and scowled, but he could not seem to think of anything to say. The elf smiled, on a face less surpassingly beautiful than his, it might have been mistaken for a smirk. You are here for the craft fair, I presume. Just looking at you, I can tell that you've travelled far and endured great hardships for the privilege of attending the fair. He gestured to himself with a jewelled fan that looked as though it could function as a superlative blade should the need arise. In the unlikely event that the elf had nothing better to hand, I am a Nasrith Aether, a simple metalsmith from the Athalan province on the southern coast. I too am arrived, but recently, after a long and arduous journey, Mikazrin took in the elf in his flawless attire. Perhaps we might find ourselves adjoining stalls and display our wares together. He smiled again. The elf's companions, who seemed to have emerged from the delighted throngs behind, laughed. If there was a deeper meaning to the mirth, then it was painfully obscured to Mikazrin. <clears throat> no, he gruffed, clutching the packs of his straps tightly. No, thank you, he added, shocked by the crudity of his own words, and turned away, trying hard not to run as the light laughter of the elves rang in his ears. So Mikazrin takes some time to kind of wander around the various stalls that are set out, and after seeing all the amazing craftsmanship on display at the stalls, Mikazrin actually gets um, really down about the work that he's produced and is sad. He feels that his work that he's carried from Shimon is no good. 
so he goes to a drinking house to drown his sorrows. He feels that his work is not fine enough, and he starts to kind of wonder if his son could build upon what he's found out and enter the fair in many years' time. Gormdal then appears and asks him why that he wasn't, um, you know, displaying his work outside um, of the fair, because that's what he said he was, uh, you know, aiming and uh, wanting to, to kind of do with his, um, the, you know, the, the, the craftsmanship that he's produced. Macazrin shook his head to clear it of the eerie sensation of reprising a dream. He knew it would be probably best to say nothing, particularly to an itinerant stranger of no school, however learned and venerable he might seem. But come the moment, he found his embarrassment was simply too great to share, and better to share it with an elderly stranger, he supposed, than any of his own peers at the Green Fire Arsenal. I was so arrogant, he muttered. I thought that all I had to do was get here, and the Lumineth would fall over themselves in awe of Iron World work. But you've seen what it's like out there. I can't show what I've bought here against that. For as long as there are elves living in the mortal realms, the Macazran name would be the laughing stock of Sayar. Gormdal stroked his beard thoughtfully. It was arrogant, I'll grant you, though you're hardly alone in that. He leant over the table and dropped his voice, gesturing furtively with his eyes, as if it's something over his shoulder that he would rather not alert with a more obvious gesture. Don't look now, lad, but you're in the capital of the elves. Macazrin fought with a smile, and Gormdal leant back again as the server returned. The younger Dwardin watched, feeling faintly disorientated, as if by a street magician's sleight of hand, as plates were laid out across the table, a symmetry of glistering, glistening seafood and colourful vegetables that would have been a work of art, even if every dish that composed it had been less perfect. You see the jewels they all wear, said Gormdal, watching him, as the server shook his head. Sorry, um, as the server departed. Ether quartz, they all carry it high and low. If there is such a thing as low amidst the realm lords, it lends inspiration and insight, and the Sayari in particular use it in their crafting. He picked up a lightly grilled piece of tentacle. All their crafting, in fact, because why make something excellent when you can make something unique and perfect Every single time you pick up a hammer. Some of us might call that cheating, but it's a poor workman who blames his tools, as the old saying goes. So you can't well look in envy at the tools of a great one, can you? There's nothing wrong with my tools. I didn't say there was. Then it's with my work. Chewing on his squid, Gormdall wrapped his knuckles on the table. Get it out then, beardling, and let's have a look at it. You wouldn't show me before, but... You may as well show me now. Nodding resigned, Macazrin turned to the chair beside him where he'd sat with his pack and delved inside. He withdrew a number of small pieces. The arsendalum, a hextant, a shamanite compass that floated on a small cushion of ether gold when unwrapped and set them out on the table. He pulled the goggles from around his neck and set them down too. Last to emerge was a bundle of soft fleece which when unfastened revealed a brass cylinder about six inches long. He let it rest on his palm for a moment, the weight of it soaking into his hand, feeling the cool of the metal and the rivets in his skin, reenacting in his mind the act of casting and setting each and every piece by hand. Then, and only then, he opened it, releasing silver clasps and unpackaging sliding segments to produce a tube closer to three feet in length. So, Macazrin is shaking his head. It, you know, he's still really gutted about his work. And he's thinking about how he can improve it. He's saying about reworking the tube in gold, adding jewels and inlay. And, and Gormdal says that he wants to show Macazrin something. So, they finish up the food. And then Gormdal led him down a flight of stairs that ran behind the back of a farrier's shop and towards a cellar. The sound of a struck hammer and the blast of furnaces rang through the stones. It was a comforting and familiar din that despite the Sayari reputation and all the evidence of their craftsmanship, 
had been strangely absent from Ar Askenaf until then. However, the shaped, however they shaped the work of their hands and their hearts, it was in some other fashion to the heat and beating of the iron world. This, however, felt familiar, in spite of the light that, even as they ventured underground, beat from every surface, it felt like coming home. They came to an iron-bound door, the air was warm, and Gormdal pushed the door open and entered. A huge golden forge spitting fire was set into the far wall. Its bell-shaped central body was in the shape of an ancestor's head, similar to that which Macazarin carried with him, albeit on a much grander scale and with small differences in style. The beard was emblazoned with glowing runes and framed the furnace in the figure's mouth. Black smoke rose like a crest from the chimney in its crown. A single well-muscled Dwardin, naked from the waist up, tended to the flames, with a curt nod to Gormdal that looked almost like a bow and a most curious look. He withdrew without a word. A magmic battle forge, said Gormdal, sticking his thumbs under his belt and rocking back onto his heels. It belongs to the battlesmiths of the Thungor Lodge. You may have seen them at the festival. Mm. The Lumineth do love lunar rests fire steel. They think it quaint, but don't tell the Thungor I said so, otherwise they might not let us borrow their forge. Borrow? Macazrin backed away from the fire-breathing idol, so different from the precision furnaces and kilns of the Ironwell arsenal. Why would one of Grimnir's sons loan you a forge? Because I asked. And who are you to them? Much as I am to you, no more and no less. The old Dwarden gave a strange smile, all black teeth and orange, orange shadows in the flickering light. It was the first time Macazrin had seen shadows since he left Shimon, and the sight of them startled him. Do you find that odd? The fire slayers in the iron well might may share an ancestor, but there's no kinship between us. Macazrin looked up at the glowering god held. The heat of it, greater than any forge in his home city, made his eyeballs ache and the ends of his beard curl. We're cousins who seldom speak and have nothing left in common, but we're all of us Dwardin. We've a way of remembering and when the moment is right, and that moment is now. <laughs> Gormdall laughed and clapped both hands on Macazrin's back. To get one over on the algae, it is always that moment. I don't know that word. What does it mean? It's very old, but don't think on that now. Gently, but inexorably, both hands still on Macazrin's shoulder, the old master guided the engineer towards the bright, hot mouth of the magma forge. Take out your handicraft, beardling. As though hypnotised by the roaring flame and the old Dwardin's voice, Macazrin unpacked his telescope. He looked down at it, then up into the blistering heat of the forge. This is too delicate an instrument for such a workplace. It won't be better by the heat of a forge, nor by hammer and tongs. Gormdal smiled. His face shone red in the furnace heat, and his eyes gleamed like precious metals. You spoke before of jewels, of golden ornaments. You'll not better this work with those either. There's beauty to be had in such things, but only in the proper place. And nothing conveys beauty to a Dwardin than a thing built to do a task and do it well. A shirt of mail that won't break under a blow. A perfectly cast cannon that will never mischarge in a thousand firings. Those things are beautiful. If you know your craft, and trust me, the Sayari do know their craft, but they take their inspiration from their realm stone and from their light. We're Dwardin. The spirit of our craft comes from some place much deeper. He tapped on his beard where it smothered his broad chest. It's in our blood and it's in our bones. The pure need to make things. It's in our soul, isn't it? Go on, beardling, feel it. Don't look to imitate the elves with their fancy stones and their pretty metals. Better them. Amaze them with something they've never seen before. And with all the ether quartz of the ten paradises can scarce imagine. You're a Dwarden engineer. Impress the Sayari with what that really means. As he spoke, he turned fully to the forge. Think, beardling. Find the purpose in what you mean to create and bring it out. Forget what your ancestors did or what you think they might wish of you now and feel what you would have the maker fashioned through your hands. Mikazrin looked down into his hands. 
The tube's bass brass casing rippled red in the flames. The outermost lenses in the aperture glinted. He felt a stirring in his chest, something almost spiritual, an enlightenment, but one that was all his own and behold to no one else. Captured not from light and realm magic, but from the quintessence of his own heritage, his beard tingled as if with a divine charge as he looked up into the fire, the fire of making. Yes, I think I see it. Gormdil clapped him on the back. Macazrin barely felt it. He was too deep in thought. The old Dwarden asked him a question. Not long, he muttered, scarcely listening as he bent to work. This won't take long up at all. So, Macazrin continues to, to make his uh, offering for the craft fair and eventually displays his work. The Luminath Realm Lords are blown away at how amazing it is and a massive crowd draws around his stall, you know, saying that the craftsmanship, you know, they're, 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 they're trying to work out, you know, how is it so good? They're saying it's uh, clarity and elegance. Um, they're saying that, you know, it, it, it is simply su sublime, superb. They absolutely love it. It's been a huge success. And the elf that spoke to Mikazrin at the start, when he first arrived at Aaron Esketh, um, you know, when he says about, oh, would you like some help, friend? Um, actually takes offence when Mikazrin says to him, because um, they do set up stalls next to each other, I should probably thank you for helping me secure this stall next to yours. Um, and he can't resist adding on at the end. You might learn something. And the, the, the Lumineth Realm Lord, you know, is really cross at that, um, at that kind of slight. Um, but luckily Gormdal reappears and he says, Now, now, said Gormdal, appearing from the crowd behind them both, putting one tanned fatherly hand on Mikazrin's shoulder and the other on Anastarith's back. The elves of quick hearts, as are too readily aggrieved, unlike the Dwarden, who will shrug off almost any insults unless they are determined to be affronted, and so I want to speak idly in jest. Nought was mean by it, Master Aether. The elf hesitated, as though searching for the hidden sign, or slight, or alternate meaning in the old Dwarden's words, and appeared quite flummoxed at discovering none. He snapped his fan blade closed. Macazrin grumbled and holstered his pistol. Half the crowd muttered in disappointment. The other half whispered its approval. <laughs> Good, said Gormdal and chuckled. Always have Dwarden and elves found ways to make less of one another, which is as it should be. Grundney and Teclis are as like to one another as any good rival ought to be. Where would any of us, fighter or maker or thinker, be without someone to better? He glanced up to the taller elf, without another rung on the Teclian ladder to climb. Who are you, Dwarden, said Anastarith, so wise in the hearts of elves? Just a wanderer, said Gormdal. In Ithalin, I'm considered a master of my art, but with you... I almost feel the thrill of being a new apprentice, starting anew on my journey of enlightenment. There is so much I could learn from you. Aye, I'd wager there is. He picked up one of the lenses from Mikazrin's table and presented it to the artisan. His eyes twinkled with hish light, shone and infinitely refracted through the shamanic crystal. I'd wager you've a lot. So... That is our third story in the Chronicles of the Wanderer. Um, as always, I'd love to get your opinion on it. So this time we saw the, uh, the story from the perspective of the uh, Ironweld Arsenal. Um, and you know what? I, I, you know, I really think this is kind of building up into something that we'll see in the, um, in the Broken Realms narrative. It looks as though um, Gormdul, the old master, the white beard, you know, however you want to, to see him as, is looking to kind of unify um, the Dwarden together. You know what? And, and to see him working with the elves as well, uh, maybe there will be a greater unification there. You know, there's lots of talk about order working together to kind of drive out the darkness and chaos. Um, I'd love to get your opinion. Um, if you've not already subscribed to the channel, if you could do so, that would be amazing. And if you could drop a like to, to, um, to below, that would be much appreciated too. I'm looking forward to speaking with you in the comments. Um, and thanks for joining me uh, once again. Bye-bye.